In space, no one can hear you scream. Or is that, in space, no one can hear ice cream? Well, either way, we know that no supernovas, crashing asteroids, and burning planets make a sound in space. Or do they? What if you actually can hear something out there? Well, let's see. Okie dokie, back to middle school. Ahem. Sound is a mechanical way of originating from vibration. Uh, what exactly does that mean? Well, the simplest example is guitar strings. Let's pluck one of them. It starts to vibrate. The atoms inside the metal string begin to push and beat the atoms of the air around them. So now, atoms are constantly pushing each other until they reach our ears. It's like a wave from a pebble thrown into a pond, and it happens very quickly at a speed of about 761 miles per hour. Then our eardrums begin to vibrate at the same frequency. And the little bones inside our ears transmit this vibration to the brain. The brain then does its magic, recognizes the pattern, and turns it into sounds. Great! Now we know that we need some particles to create sound. And we can find these particles in gases, liquids, and solid substances. And what about space? Nope, it's almost a perfect vacuum. And you've probably already heard that there's no sound in space because it's a vacuum. But what does it actually mean? Well, a vacuum is a perfect void. It's an area completely devoid of matter. It means there's nothing there. Yeah. Despite all those celestial bodies in space, there's actually no air in between them. No atoms, no particles, nothing. Not a zippo. Well, almost. To be honest, the perfect vacuum doesn't really exist. We can't get rid of atoms for good. But space is very close to this notion. On average, there are 15 to 80 atoms per one cubic inch. This may sound like a big number, but keep in mind that these atoms are tiny, and the void distance between them is huge. For comparison, one cubic inch of air contains about 16,000 atoms. So, of course, with such a low density, these atoms can't push each other. Even if the vibration is very strong, like, I don't know, a supernova, they still won't be able to do that. So, movies have been lying to us. All these epic space scenes actually take place in an awkward silence. Who would have guessed? But don't get upset. What if I tell you there are, in fact, some ways to hear sound in space? First of all, there's still sound on other planets. If there's an atmosphere on a space body, or at least something like gas, water, or a solid surface, there will be sound. In our case, the atmosphere becomes completely silent at about 60 miles above the Earth's surface. That's where the sky stops being blue and a black starry veil begins. In any case, we'd have to land on another planet, or at least get close to its atmosphere to hear something. But whatever it is, it would sound very different. Let's take our favorite Venus as an example. The atmosphere there is very dense. Scientists jokingly call it a thick chemical soup. No thanks. So if you somehow managed to stay alive and speak there, your voice would be very different. It would become much louder and it would sound deeper. So if you want a pleasant baritone, you know what to do. I wonder what would happen if Earth had a denser atmosphere. What would we hear then? Well, you can vaguely imagine that if you've ever been in the water. Water is very dense. Sound moves there much faster and better compared to the air, at a speed of almost a mile per second, depending on the water temperature. So if you sit in an empty room with no sound sources, you won't hear much, right? Now, dip your head in the water and check out how the same silence sounds here. It's not quiet at all. Even if you ignore the ever-present sounds of the water itself, you'll immediately notice how well you can hear your own body, how your blood pulsates in the veins, how your heart works, the slightest movement of your fingers. Kind of creepy, isn't it? This gives us an idea of what would happen to us on a planet with a denser atmosphere. And that's just crazy. We would hear everything. From scurrying animals to the movement of tectonic plates. Ah, come on, you'd probably say. It's obvious that there's sound on other planets. But didn't you say we can hear something in open space? Actually, yes. For example, in a cloud of dust. You can find space dust almost everywhere in space. 
It may be the remains of a star or something else. And in these places, everything is a bit denser than usual. This means there are probably dust clouds where particles are very close to each other, which means they can produce sounds. Of course, those will be very quiet and transmitted over a very short distance. But it's better than nothing, right? Plus, we already have one real space sound recorded. It came from the Perseus galaxy, which is located 250 million light-years away from us. NASA recorded it in 2003. Those of us music geeks will want to know that it's a B-flat, 57 octaves below middle C on the piano. You'd have to add another 660 keys to the left on the keyboard. But its frequency is so low that the human ear unfortunately can't hear it. But besides that, we can only hear something inside spaceships. These are small pockets of air, after all. In a spacesuit, you would hear sounds very well, too, including your breathing or blood circulation in a spacesuit. But two astronauts flying side by side wouldn't hear each other, even if they got very close and shouted very loudly. It's quite funny. If you, being an astronaut, bumped into something, it would be very loud for you, but your friend wouldn't hear anything. That's why astronauts use radio devices. Now, purely theoretically, if you could somehow crawl out of your spacesuit and survive, you'd be able to hear the chatter and noises going on inside the spaceship. But how? So look, we have some air inside the spaceship, and it transmits sound. It reaches the metal casing and gets through it. And then, if you leaned against the ship, preferably touching it with your elbow or knee, the sound would be transmitted to the brain directly through your bones, ignoring the ears. Yes, our bones conduct sound. That's how, for example, deaf people listen to music. It's called bone conduction. It's used in some headphones and some other technologies. You can do a little experiment. Hold your fingers over your ears. Shut them properly so that you really don't hear much. Then try to touch a sound source. It can be anything vibrating. For example, a speaker playing music with some part of your body where the bone is close to the skin. Now, watch the miracle happen. You can hear the sound not through your ears, but directly in your brain. But please, don't repeat this experiment in open space. You know, ice cream? <laughs> now, you've probably heard about things like the sounds of space, where you can listen, for example, to the sounds made by the sun or different planets. How do we record these ones? Easily. There is another way to hear sound in space. Electromagnetic waves. In other words, a radio. Radio is the same form of electromagnetic radiation as light. These waves can travel in a vacuum without any problems. Astronauts' transmitters work that way. An astronaut says something to their friend. The sound waves turn into radio waves, reach the other person, and are then converted back into sounds. And this is how we get so-called space sounds. Our planet is actually very loud in that regard. We're sending a huge amount of radio waves into the universe, all radio signals we've ever listened to. It's a pity that they travel only 110 light-years away from us. But you know, I think it's good that we don't hear everything that happens in space. Imagine if sound could easily travel through the universe? We would hear everything, from solar flares to nearby supernovas. Horrifying, right? So maybe we're just lucky. Hey, remember, in space, you can hear ice cream. Chocolate! Vanilla! Ever wondered what it would be like to hear the sound of a black hole? <laughs> NASA's got you covered. Here is a screaming black hole. Screaming in space? <laughs> I thought in space no one can hear you scream. Well, let me explain. Using a telescope, NASA examined the movements of hot gas in a cluster of galaxies in 2002. Then they converted what they found into a sonification. The sound, mm, how can I put it politely, wasn't appealing, but that's okay. After all, you're able to hear the noise hot gas produces in a cluster of galaxies 250 million light years away. Hey, how would you like to hear the sound gas produces right here on Earth? Yeah, never mind. Sound waves already existed over there in the gas cluster, so experts just rescaled them to the range of human hearing. This is how they converted the input coming from the telescope. The principle is universal. 
In our atmosphere, we can hear stuff because pressure waves move through a medium like liquid or gas. Sound waves in these galaxies can also move because they're surrounded by gas. What does it have to do with black holes? Well, the thing triggering those pressure waves in the cluster is a giant black hole. To be more precise, it's a supermassive black hole that weighs millions of times more than the sun. Wow! Experts still don't fully understand the relationship between supermassive black holes and the cluster surrounding them. They only know that these two evolve together, they're interrelated. The cluster feeds the black hole with new material and so on. And in return, the black hole heats the cluster. That's all we know. Now, this made me wonder how large the biggest black holes are. There are four types of black holes stellar, intermediate, supermassive, and miniature. Naturally, the biggest ones fall into the category of supermassive. The largest black hole in the universe we've discovered so far is about 66 billion times larger than the Sun. It's one of the brightest objects in the universe. Astronomers keep scanning space and finding new black holes. But have you wondered when the first black hole was spotted? It was discovered by different researchers independently in 1971. Scientists first confirmed that these objects were formed from the remnants of massive stars. After a black hole appeared, it then consumed all the nearby objects. Here is a quick recap of how these space objects work. Their gravitational force is super strong. Nothing can escape a black hole after crossing the event horizon. Black holes eat everything, hey, just like me. <laughs> I mean, even light gets trapped inside them. What's even cooler slash scarier is that the laws of time and space become distorted there. If you were falling into a black hole, you would realize that time slows down there. Einstein explains this in his famous general relativity theory. In very, very basic terms, time gets affected by how fast you are moving at extreme speeds. NASA has discovered a rapidly growing black hole. But don't worry, the world isn't in danger. This black hole has been in front of the eyes of astronomers this whole time. It's in a region of a well-studied sky field. Astronomers say that this hole formed 750 million years after the Big Bang. You know, the birth of our universe. So why are black holes so bright? Well, that's a bit ironic. When I defined this space phenomenon, I said that black holes were so dense that even light got trapped there. But ask any astrophysicist, and they'll confirm that black holes are among the brightest objects in space. That's because black holes don't exist alone. They sit at the centers of galaxies and are usually surrounded by clouds of hot gas. And these clouds create cosmic auroras around black holes. I must mention, though, that you can't see a black hole directly. What you see is actually the effects it has on its environment. For instance, you can see space objects being ripped apart by a black hole. Remember when the first time ever silhouette image of a black hole was shared with the public in 2019? Proof, you fellas! You wouldn't really see the black hole if there was no orange ring. Why is the ring orange and not green or purple? The dark shadow inside is the shadow of the black hole. The glowing orange of the bright ring in the image isn't the real hue of the gas. I'm a little heartbroken here. It's a representation picked by researchers to depict the brightness of the emissions. A scientist explained that yellow is the most intense emission, red is less intense, and black has little or no emission at all. In the optical range, this ring would likely seem white, perhaps tinged with blue or red. Now, spaghettification is a real word. That's an astonishing ability black holes have. If a giraffe fell into a black hole, it would stretch into a long spaghetti-like strand. On Earth, the giraffe's legs are closer to the center of Earth, so they're more powerfully attracted to the surface than the animal's head. This rule works in the animal's favor on Earth, but would work against it inside a black hole. In a black hole, there's extreme gravity. The closer the giraffe's legs got to the center of the black hole, the more the pull of gravity would stretch them. And the closer to the center the giraffe got, the faster its legs would move. But the top half of the giraffe's body would be farther away so it wouldn't move toward the center as fast as the legs. Here comes the spaghettification. Can we have meatballs with that? No? Okay. The only difference between a black hole and our sun 
is that the center of the hole is made of super-dense material. It provides the black hole with a strong gravitational field that can trap everything, including light. This is why we can't see black holes. Did you know that, theoretically, you could turn anything into a black hole? For instance, if you shrank the sun to approximately 4 miles across, you would compress the matter inside to an extremely small size. This would make it so dense that our star would turn into a black hole. You could do the same with a planet or even your own body. Is there something called a white hole, or is it just a myth? White holes exist, in theory. Hypothetically, they function in the opposite way to black holes. Nothing can enter them. Physicists think of black and white holes as yin and yang, or two sides of the same coin. For them, a white hole looks exactly like a black hole, which makes different things come out of it. But the existence of white holes hasn't been proven yet. And how about wormholes? There are so many movies about black holes and wormholes. How many of them are based on reality, and how much is fiction? Some people believe that black holes function like wormholes. You go inside and exit in another part of the universe. Since we still have a lot to learn and discover about physics, no one can prove this theory is wrong or right. Astrophysics says we need to have a solid theory that unifies general relativity with quantum mechanics. Black holes are among the largest structures in the universe, but there might be tiny specimens. The mass of the smallest black hole we know about is only three times greater than that of our sun. Now, apparently, black holes can vanish. Stephen Hawking developed a theory of Hawking radiation. According to it, radiation decreases the mass and rotational energy of black holes, and ultimately, they evaporate. This process occurs very slowly, though, if we're not talking about small black holes. Astronomers have discovered an elusive black hole in the neighboring galaxy. What makes this one special is the fact that it's the first dormant stellar black hole outside of our galaxy. This type of black hole is hard to observe because such holes don't interact much with their environment. They don't emit as much radiation as other black holes. Well, back on Earth, what about sinkholes? Well, different physics. Yet, if you cross the event horizon, your whole car can disappear. Whoops! The ground shakes and you hear a loud cracking sound. Oh no, the dome is failing. Everyone runs to their escape pods to evacuate. People are pushing and shoving. The Earth-like atmosphere in the dome is going to be compromised, and you'll be exposed to the thin elements on the surface of Mars. Everyone rushes to put their helmets on. The crack is getting bigger by the second, and people are panicking, trying to get on the escape shuttles as quickly as possible. In the chaos, they all jam into the wrong ships, and there isn't any room for you. Red warning lights begin to flash in the dome, and a voice rings out, telling everyone to put their helmets on. The Martian atmosphere is only minutes away from rushing in, and humans won't be able to breathe otherwise. This is just your luck. You only just arrived on Mars. As the ships zoom off into the distance, you wonder what you should do. You call out for help, but no one answers. Suddenly, a robot guide rolls up behind you, and you hear a faint noise coming from its speakers. It says, no one can hear you because the atmosphere on Mars is so much less dense than on Earth. It also has a lot of carbon dioxide, which absorbs sound waves. Even if a loud concert was happening just 30 feet away, it would sound like it was miles away. Would you like me to assist you with anything? You ask it for help, and it shows you a 3D layout of the entire dome. You can see a few other shuttle stations, so you decide to aim for them. Unfortunately, you're going to need to get to the opposite side of the dome to reach another shuttle station. Just as you begin to panic and wonder how you could get there, the robot transforms into a bike and tells you to hop on. You get in and cruise through the city, looking at all the empty buildings and streets. The crack is getting even bigger, and tiny pieces of the dome begin to fall from above, like snow. When you arrive at the other station, the last few people are boarding the only shuttle. You chase after them, desperately trying to get their attention. As you ding the bell on your bike, though, it barely makes any noise at all. Their ship pulls away before they can notice you. You ask why sounds aren't working, and the robot explains that you can barely hear high-pitched noises on Mars. The carbon dioxide makes high-pitched noises, like bells and chirping birds, almost impossible to hear. If only you were still on Earth, they might have noticed you. 
the robot tells you that there's one last chance to escape. He transforms into a tiny spaceship. You get in, and he flies through the crack in the dome out into space. It's going so fast that you should be back on Earth before long. Just as you're starting to relax and enjoy the sights of space, you see a red light flashing on the robot. You ask it what's wrong, but you get no response. Suddenly, you realize that you can't hear anything in space. Sound travels in waves, and it needs something to move through, like air or water. Space is a vacuum with no air, so you can't hear any sounds at all. The spaceship suddenly changes direction and blasts off away from Earth. You try to steer the robot in the right direction, but you can't figure out how to get its attention. The ship charts a flight all the way to Venus. As you get closer, the turbulence kicks in. Venus has winds faster than any tornado on Earth. You keep getting swept away, trying to find a safe space to land in. The robot manages to keep a steady course, despite the wind throwing it all over the place. You can already feel the heat through all the layers. Finally, the robot spots a small cave in the distance and attempts to land there. As soon as the robot touches ground, it morphs into a spacesuit you can wear, so you're safe in the extreme environment. Today's forecast in Venus? Heat. Extremely boiling temperatures all day and night. Expect clouds of sulfuric acid and gale force winds. The atmosphere is mainly made up of carbon dioxide, so you can expect your voice to drop deeper too because of the planet's dense atmosphere. It's only the second planet closest to the sun, but it's actually the hottest. Its atmosphere traps the heat from the sun and keeps it around the planet. It's actually so hot on Venus that it could melt lead. If you were cruising by with the spaceship, the whole thing would melt in a matter of minutes. Luckily, you have this indestructible robot armor. You try to ask the robot how to get back, and your voice sounds crazy. Your vocal cords vibrate slower here than on Earth, which makes the pitch lower. But at the same time, the speed of sound on Venus is a lot faster, making it more squeaky. Then, the high carbon dioxide content in the air creates a weird effect that tricks your brain into thinking that the sound source is small. Overall, you sound something like a cartoon duck. You look out across the horizon and see many hills and mountains scattered across the plain. But the robot tells you that many of these are volcanoes. Venus actually has more volcanoes than any other planet in the solar system. Scientists discover more than 1,600 only on the surface, which could mean there are even more than that still undiscovered. Yeah, maybe being here all day isn't such a good idea. And not just because of the heat. A single day on Venus lasts 243 Earth days. In fact, a day on Venus is longer than a year, because it only takes 225 days for it to complete a rotation around the sun. It's hard to understand each other, but you eventually manage. The robot tells you that it just got lost, and that you'll be back on Earth in no time. While walking around the cave, you realize that you're actually inside a volcano. You tell the robot to hurry up and get you back home before it erupts. It's clearly not very good at navigating space, though because it's not long before you end up somewhere else. You're now on Titan, Saturn's largest moon. The moon is so large that it's even bigger than Mercury, the planet closest to the sun. The spaceship arrives in the atmosphere, which feels and behaves similar to Earth's. The only noticeable difference is the orangey haze hanging in the air, which makes it a lot more difficult to see. As you descend towards the moon, the robot detects signs of cyanide gas all over the surface and fluffy clouds made out of iced methane. You land on a soft spot and set about trying to get the robot to take you back to the right place. At least this time, you're not sweating. The robot transforms again and begins to scan the surroundings. The atmosphere is around 60% thicker than on Earth. Walking around feels like you're wading through maple syrup. There is a really high nitrogen content in the air, so things sound surprisingly similar to how they do on Earth. You tell the robot you really want to get home now, but it comes out as a loud, raspy shout. This is because Titan has more nitrogen than Earth, and because sound travels a bit slower. Luckily, you can still understand each other here. The robot tells you that it needs to absorb a bit more energy from its solar panels before taking off. So you have a look around. This moon is one of the only things in the solar system that has fixed bodies of liquid like rivers, lakes, and seas on its surface. You can understand why the robot got lost now, given how similar Titan is to Earth. 
Titan even has liquid cycles, with rain, evaporation, and condensation. This isn't water, like back on Earth, though. The main liquid here is methane. Scientists think that there may be volcanic activity, but instead of molten hot lava spewing out, it's water. Other planets, like Mars, have ice on the peaks of their mountains and evidence of water beneath the surface. But nothing is as close to Earth as Titan. Some scientists believe that this moon could be our next home billions of years from now. The sun's temperature will increase by then, making the Earth's atmosphere uninhabitable. By then, Titan's cool temperatures will be good enough to create stable oceans and sustain life. The robot finally gathers enough electricity to fly away, so you can head home. It'll be nice to have a normal conversation where your voice doesn't sound like an exaggerated cartoon. Whew.